to the all new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast this is matt in minnesota and chris in south london welcome to our june podcasts yay how's it going chris uh it's 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 going well it's uh it's a gray holiday weekend here in, here in london um but people of london will know holiday weekends it the weather just tends to deteriorate and uh yes so it's a it's a it's a it's a wet holiday monday not too dissimilar here in uh minnesota it's uh <laughs> kind of cold and dreary so it's a yes perfect podcast and book weather i think yes and it's that rarity in which the american and british kind of holiday weekend schedules collide we are not celebrating memorial day uh, we're just celebrating late may bank holiday <laughs> wonderful <laughs> it's the official name but yes <laughs> there are no parades or anything alas <laughs> yeah sli- slightly different meaning i think <laughs> <laughs> yes so this month, uh, Chris, was your pick, and I believe it was uh, The Face of the Enemy by yes. David McKinty. Yes. At least yes. I hope yes. so. I hope I read the right book. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 yes. It was David A. McKinty. Did he always use the A? I'm trying to think. But uh, anyway, sorry, this is a rather um, tedious rabbit hole for me to descend so early on. Uh, but yeah. Chris, what do you have for uh, show and tell this month? Um, so I-, I was just thinking, uh, the show itself, it's... Uh, it, we, we've been back now for um, a number of weeks, and uh, the and I think it's rather good. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into too many spoilers because I know that uh, some of our listeners are kind of wanting to wait until the entire season is done before watching it. Hi, Sean. I, I think that Capaldi is going out on a high. I really do. Um, uh, and I do think it is amusing as well how many kind of elements from the books that we've been covering seem to be kind of. Um, popping up um, or kind of like, you know, I wouldn't say being borrowed, but uh, there are certainly aspects that you're kind of seeing in the TV series, um, uh, like uh, sort of without going into any spoilers, the pyramid is, yeah, we have a pyramid appearing in the TV series and uh, that's kind of similar to what happens, yeah, to we have a pyramid randomly appearing in uh, one of the books we've read. Uh, Big Bang Generation. It's great. It, it's it, it's wonderful. Uh, and also, I would say that you know, uh, the characterization of kind of Bill has been brilliant, uh, and Nardole has been fun. And it it's it's also good. It's just such a shame that that this is the kind of like the first and only season of this Tardis group. I I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I think um, it, it is a shame that it that we only get the one season. But I'm hoping that. Uh big finish will be there to fill in quite a few of the gaps (laughs) at some point in the future because you're right i think the chemistry they've got and it always it seems like it always takes two or three years you know to find that for each Hmm. doctor i think it's the rare exception like um you know liz sladen worked better with tom baker Hmm. than i thought she did with with uh, john pertwee but um one of the things i've really enjoyed about this season too and i'm one episode behind you in terms of uh where where we're at I, I haven't seen the the pyramid episode yet but i know it's coming is i really have enjoyed how much this series is kind of linked to get together almost in that 1960s sort of way where you go from story to story and you have this mm. through thread that's you know it's it's there if you want to pick up on it but it's also um it's nice that it's it feels more like a like a cohesive ongoing narrative i guess yeah 
which um, I've enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I, I remember somebody saying, uh, a friend of mine at the time, Chris Eccleston's uh, sort of season. So just after it being announced that Eccleston departed, it was like um, falling in love with someone at school and then realizing that person was leaving. Um, it's mm. uh, it feels a bit like that. It's just like oh, oh. I mean, not that I um, not that I haven't enjoyed Capaldi's other seasons, but uh, I, I just it's 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 just so good, and yeah. and he looks like he's having a blast as well. I feel like his characters progress too quite a bit. Where he mm. um, that seventy years or so on Earth, and then you know the twenty or thirty years he's spent with river mm. so even though he's forgotten you know a lot of what clara taught him maybe not so much emotionally but you know in in his head sort of thing mm. um it just it feels to me like this is the doctor you know you know how colin baker talked about how he always had like a seven-year plan and yeah he wanted to, you know layers of a cake sort of thing i feel like yes. we've, we've gotten that with capaldi like because you look at how he started so gruff and then though just the prog progression along that spectrum has been really um really well done i think yeah well in many ways capaldi is kind of colin baker done right um uh, and uh, with the with the assistance of, uh, of of very good writers uh because I, I would say that the colin baker era possibly was underserved by its scripts um yeah. I should say uh but uh, which reminds me there's a bizarre little thing at the back of the uh, paperback version of face of the enemy um, so sort of talks about kind of video releases, if you remember those children, uh, and uh, sort of talks about um, sort of time lash as being something that you might enjoy. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, please, please, please do not put the people that have suddenly stumbled across the TV series due to the Paul McGann uh, movie and, so, and started reading the books. Don't put them in the direction of time lash. We don't want them to leave. Right, I think that's enough rambling from me. Uh, what um, what exciting things do you have from um, the show and tell? For me, I just really a little bit of a recap about the uh, convention. So last month, mm. we had a council room in Minneapolis, the one that uh, Peter Davison uh, skipped <laughs> to, to stay down in Texas with Sean. <laughs> but uh, it's the barbecue, I'm sure. It's the barbecue. <laughs> Yeah, but it was it was fun. It was uh, very pleasant, kind of low key, um, just about the right size. Let's say about five hundred people or so. Um, Janet Fielding and Gary Russell were the guests of honor, along with um, Chris Jones and Kathy Sullivan, who's mm -hmm. done some big finish work. Janet, kind of funny story. She was coming into town from Chicago, and Thursday evening at the guest of honor reception, she she sat opposite of me uh, at one of the tables, and. <laughs> She looked around the table and she said, I think I'm going to be sick. <laughs> and, she <got> up. <laughs> oh, and she got up and left. She uh oh, it turns out she had she got food poisoning <laughs> when she was in Chicago. So um she was recovering from that throughout most of the weekend. <laughs> um so but she did um at one point she did talk quite a bit about the uh spirit of light convention which was mm. back in November of 1983. Mm. And that was the U.S. equivalent of the 20th anniversary of Longleat, uh, mm. which was earlier that year in May. And it also, I think, predates Gallifrey One by about five years. Mm. And it was it took place during the shooting of um, Chaos of Androzani. So in between the location filming for that story, the entire you know cast basically jetted off to to chicago and uh you know be, before the studio sessions and yeah. i i suspect that was where um jnt shored up some of the uh, regeneration cameos that happened in the studio mm. sessions because um lo a lot of companions all the living doctors were uh were there but one of the stories janet told was about that weekend was that her and lala ward had rented a uh, stretch limous a limousine which was <laughs> a novelty at, at the time yes on the monday after the convention and i might be getting this mixed up but i believe it was lala that told janet this but although it might have also been another close friend of janet's that was friends with douglas adams but i think it was lala um lala had told her what uh 42 meant in the douglas adams books so right. janet told the told the audience so it's it's out there now i guess <laughs> have you 
have you heard the, this before? Like what? No, I don't what, think so. I don't, okay. No, no. So the um the sound it's the the answer. So it's it's in the sound of the words. So if hmm. you repeat forty two kind of over and over again, yeah. you get fortitude. Ah. So what is the answer that gets you through life, the universe, and everything? Fortitude. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, so that, that's, that, that's... that made up for her being <laughs> Yeah, oh, no, that's lovely. Dinner. Yeah. That's lovely. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that, that's really nice. And then a couple of things from uh, that I picked up from Gary Russell. Um, hmm. He mentioned that, uh, he, well, he, he clarified the record on Nicholas Courtney. And oh, okay. the involvement in Sarah Jane Adventures, he walked that back a bit, and he said that um, mm-hmm. it was really he that he had Nick's contact info, but that the the idea was probably Russell or Julie's. But then he w- but then he went on to say that he was much more instrumental in getting Katie Manning to appear in the uh, the Matt Smith episode. Mm. And then he also talked about how he prefers writing for for past doctors. He felt there was too much collaboration necessary when having to move the needle forward on writing new adventures or eighth doc mm. the eighth doctor range. So he only did he only ever wrote one book for each of the ranges in the the new adventures style. So legacy for the seventh, um placebo effect for the eighth, mm. and then big bang generation for the for the current crop. That that I found was kinda of interesting. He also mentioned he was um self taught and that he uh always writes the ending of his book first, then the beginning then specific scenes, then a new beginning. So the old beginning becomes chapter four. <laughs> <laughs> and then right. he kind of, then he kind of writes the connective tissue within. And then he also talked about how he follows the chart from the, um, the making of Doctor Who book. Yes. From the seventies. Yeah. The Malcolm Polk. Kind of the flow of a story. He tries to replicate that for his prose work, but um, he said it doesn't work for audio. And I and I I guess I felt a little bit justified in my rating for um, Big Bang Generation because it turns out yeah. he wrote that in four days. Oh right! After flying back <laughs> from Australia, he locked himself in a London hotel room because Justin Richards was uh, after him. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I was going to say because um, the is yeah if. If the fourth scene was originally the beginning, uh, then that would also answer quite a few. <laughs> like that's, that's the, the interesting structure of that book, uh, and uh, how it possibly doesn't necessarily all fit together. But uh, yeah, okay. So that's the, my little convention report. Yeah, well, that's brilliant. So let's talk about David Mc. Or, mm. Is it McKinty? McKinty, I McKinty. think. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you find um, that uh, David McKinty had put some notes up about Face of the Enemy, kind of like a, some his own annotations? Um, I did not. So, um, so Mr. McKinty started uh, uh, sort of with the New Adventures and wrote uh, uh, White Darkness, uh, First Frontier. I'm going from memory here. Sanctuary. There were others as well, and I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, he also wrote Missing Adventures, including uh, the um, the Shadow of Wing Chang, The Dark Path, uh, which uh, may or may not be relevant to this book, as the Dark Path features the Master, um, and uh, that's uh, I think that the Master is one of his kind of his interests. Um, uh, I would say in in the kind of the world of Doctor Who. Uh, I would also guess that he's probably quite a big of a James Bond fan, I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he's also written some Star Trek books, too. Yes. Yeah, he has. Um, he's written... Um, a, a, um, I think he wrote a kind of like a Voyager continuity guide thing or something like that. Um, and uh, I know he has definitely written novels in the Star Trek universe. Um, the only Star Trek novels I've ever read have been by Peter David. Uh, so I don't know about David McKinty's work. Are you familiar with his work outside of um, The World of the Tardis? Not really, no. Yeah, I had third book of or fourth book of his, I, I think I've read White Darkness and First Frontier. <laughs> and then... Um, just in this past month before I read Face of the Enemy, I went back and read The Dark Path, too, hmm. just to uh, get that um, kind of... Get that away. Way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get, that, get that one read. And I, I w- went back and listen, re-listened to the uh, classic Doctor Who Book Club podcast hmm. uh, review of that one, which I think was like 
episode 11 or 12 that they did and that was fun too but yeah I'm, I'm glad i did because there there are certain elements of that that um come through into this book too um without wanting to kind of get too ahead if you if you've not read the dark path i don't think it'll necessarily hold you back it's not it's not too tightly tied in there are references to things but i don't think it's it it certainly isn't impenetrable agree 100 percent. i'd say it's like um kind of like gridlock and the makra terror in that if you yeah you can watch one without having to have experienced the other one so yeah and uh i guess this so this the kind of the structure of the book there's 21 chapters there's an Mm -hmm. author's note and then there's also a (laughs) prologue and an an epilogue did you go back and watch i i ended up pulling up on youtube just the opening and closing bits of curse of peladon yes yeah uh, certainly the opening parts um uh, and because it it does tie in quite nicely uh but before we get to before we get started with plot i'd just like to say there's something odd or curious about the dedication where he kind of says at the start that um, that he's not dedicating this book to anybody because he's learned the lesson last time. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, oh, oh, okay, that sounds a bit dark. Because his <laughs> his his book just before this one was the Dark Path, and in, in oh, that in okay. that one he wrote about how he thought this would be his last Doctor Who book ever because the right. the range was ending. Yeah. And yeah, they were losing the license and and all of that. Mm. But let me um. Let me grab it real quick because I want to see who he dedicated that to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, let's see. Oh, hmm. he's he dedicated it to Jill, the time meddler, fondly. Thank you for always being there for me. Oh. So I wonder if Jill broke up with him. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I I kind of got that vibe that there may have been some kind of uh, sadness. Uh, I hope he's not listening to this because this might be breaking his all back. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but... Well, I should say he also dedicated it to Judith Proctor, who I oh, think okay. was like a work supervisor or something, because he said, "Now you know why the first casualty was so late." So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, it could be something else entirely. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that that was quite curious. But yeah, he yeah. he his author's note from that earlier book kind of he laments you know the ending of the range and all of that and then at the beginning of this one he talks about you know oh i I got some details of the author arrangement wrong or those were cleared up for me by bbc books so now i'm on board (laughs) (laughs) so yeah because it was interesting that that there were quite few authors who did kind of like carry through um, in fact, sort of most of the recurring authors from the New Adventures range did, um, Paul Cornell, Kate Orman. Uh, so there wasn't a kind of like a, a, you know, a general downing of tools, um, uh, even though um, people would only be able to kind of introduce into the BBC universe elements that they themselves had created in the New Adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, there was possibly kind of like, you know, um, a, a more of a gentle meshing than you might have expected. Yeah, and certainly elements that he, he even refers to this as the third in his master triptych, mm. which um, I would guess that the other two would probably be First Frontier and um, Dark Path, certainly. Yes, yes, yes. Although First Frontier, I think that was the, um, or later retcon to be the, the master who appears just briefly at the beginning of uh, the TV movie, the... Um, I forget the actor's name. But um, Tipple that, or something. Tipple, something like that. But um, but yeah, who's killed by the Smurfs, pretending to be Daleks. And that master is said to look like Basil Rathbone, uh, who was Sherlock Holmes in the 30s. Mm-hmm. That's uh, um, uh, minor spoiler. Uh, I never, I gave up on First Frontier. So uh, it wasn't until a, a year or so, uh, kind of afterwards, that I uh, that I learnt that. Uh, that a master appeared in it because uh, it's not on the back. But I mean, the White Darkness um, novel. There's a character in that that I was expecting to be the master. I mean, he's certainly he's been kind of toying with putting the master or kind of master esque figures in in his books. Hmm. Cool. Anyway, shall we uh, shall we get started with uh, with with talking about uh, the novel? Sure. So I guess it opens up in the prologue with uh, the third Doctor and Joe getting into the TARDIS, um, and they're off to Peladon. 
Joe has mm. a she has a date with um Mike Yates and yeah. she wants to get back in time, but uh suffice it to say they don't they don't return as soon as they left and it's yeah. and they don't show up again until the uh the um epilogue. So really this mm. is uh a Doctor Light episode. <laughs> it is. Before that was a thing. Um and also the um the appearance because uh, Joe talks about how she's kind of going off on a date um, with Mike to say to uh, to go see a Woody Allen film because uh, um, yeah Mike knows how to treat someone. Um, for, I assume this was kind of like a little bit of a gag because in later books it's made very clear that Mike is is, is either bi or gay, mm. uh, and uh, and in fact um, I think it's implied that he settles down with Sergeant Osgood. Oh, I didn't I didn't realize that. Yeah, I, yeah, huh. yeah. I was, I was really surprised. So, suffice it to say, there are, if there's ever been a unit character mentioned <laughs> in any capacity, <laughs> they're referenced in this book somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, yes, pretty much. It's, it's yeah. very continuity heavy. Um, in yeah. in that respect, uh, yes. lots of little, um, little. You can play unit bingo. Yeah, you really can. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was, I was really surprised to see Osgood, um, throughout mm. the the book. He had, then this would be the Osgood that we know, um, who may or may not be a Zygon. Um, <laughs> yeah, the yep, father. The father. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There is. Because apparently in the comics they've started portraying Osgood as um, as as having um, oh my mind's blanking um, as, uh, an inhaler the inhaler that's that's the phrase yeah and in the um, the third Doctor comics and so thereby kind of implying a lineage or some kind of family connection. But, I mean Osgood's not that common a surname, uh, so it might well be that uh, that that he's he's a relation in some capacity. Yeah, even the uh, the the two Jimmys from you know the the pre third Doctor days, I think, get a mention that they're in town <laughs> visiting, and I think those were some of the lieutenants that uh, were in um, Lethbridge Stewart's like earliest appearances with uh, yeah. with Troughton. So you yeah. get name name checks all over the place. <laughs> yes. So while they're they're away, um, mm -hmm. there is a plane, I guess, that comes comes through some sort of distortion it appears out of nowhere and mm. crashes and it does it in airspace i can see from my window um, oh. is, yes so i can see the uh, i can see the airspace over clapham as we speak and it's very cloudy um so uh, yes i found it quite amusing um, <laughs> presumably i mean very close to, to to central London, so that would cause somewhat of a. It would have caused a bit of a panic. Yeah, um, uh, Clapham does have a, a, quite a large park area called Clapham Common, so maybe people might have thought that it could have crash landed there. But uh, yeah, it's um, a little bit east-ish of Heathrow and whatnot. There's lots of real life place names like West Drayton, which is. Um, where the um, uh, the the RAF controller is that's speaking to this plane, that's real, and uh, that's the kind of RAF base that's kind of um, vaguely near Heathrow. This plane crashes, and there's all sorts of debris everywhere, and mm -hmm. and there's a um, someone's discovered inside the plane. Yes, yeah, and it's uh, and surprisingly enough, it doesn't appear to be the pilot; it appears to be um, an MP. Uh, a dead body of an MP who uh, the, um, the brigadier had been speaking to um, just kind of earlier on that day. So immediately my mind goes to like, is it Zygons? Is it the, <laughs> is it the Kraals? You know, is there some sort of like in, invasion going on? Like, yes. or Autons? It's like, what's happening here? We've got duplicates. You'd have thought that unit would have kind of sorted this stuff out. Because uh, <laughs> they seem to have duplicates every now and again. They they should have some kind of like cast iron way of uh, of, of of dealing with this kind of mark. It's just a problem that seems to kind of affect seventies um, uh, or is it eighties Britain? Uh, yeah, have probably duplicates on the face. We should mention too that the, you know while this is set during Curse of Peladon, um, hmm. it is kind of ambiguous as to when it's set. It's not really pinned down to a specific. Um 
it, it feels very 70s for sure but i don't know that we ever get like specific dates no we don't i mean i think he, he does keep it kind of deliberately vague which i think is probably the best way to do with unit uh, i think to be honest because otherwise it's just going to kind of annoy the um, the easily annoyed yeah. <laughs> so, so well this plane is crashing kind of simultaneously across town you have this big it's like a bank heist going on yes where there's a lot of um carnage a lot of shooting and you get you get the impression that from kind of the the narrative and and the thoughts of the guards that they're not entirely on the level like this isn't a straightforward bank heist but it's Mm. it's more that the the security that's being employed by the bank is more of like the kind of the goon squad sort of um type of person coming in who's uh who's very much uh like a heavy like in a i I kept getting flashes of like uh life on mars and those 70s cop shows and yes this is definitely where we're going um because uh there was a 70s TV show called The Sweeney, uh, which Life on Mars to extent is a riff on. And uh, yeah, it just basically feels like an episode of that, uh, which is not a bad thing. It also reminds me very much of um, the start of, or the early bits of Ambassadors of Death, uh, where you have that kind of big old shootout in a warehouse. And uh, is, is it, it definitely this definitely feels like the kind of thing that... Uh, uh, Havoc, the Doctor Who stunt team at the time, could uh, easily have done. Uh, but yeah, you have just kind of uh, spectacular, kind of violent stunts. And uh, we are introduced to um, D.I. George Butcher. I know he's named after Chris. Um, yeah, I think it's Chris Boucher. Boucher, but, Boucher, yeah, Boucher. Yeah. Boucher. I, I think with his the, the his name too. I, I want to say in was it in the the McKinty's previous book, The Dark Path. Mm-hmm. He had named one of the characters after Derek Sherwin, so I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if, like, once per like every one of his books, if he has like a character named after, like, if there's a Terrence Dix that shows up, <laughs> in something, or, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> it's uh, it's funny that it's happened more than once. I, he, he's the kind of like hard-boiled kind of cop, takes no prisoners, and uh, uh, sort of. Yeah, a bit of a heavy drinker, kind of punches first and asks questions later. Um, uh, and he's kind of come to the scene of this uh, this violent bank robbery. We see, is it four or six cops in the scene? And he's the only one who ends up surviving. Um, mm-hmm. uh, includes, and, and so one of the, the dead includes uh, his nephew, who he's kind of gotten to the police force, kind of serves as a as a kind of like a, a motivating factor for him kind of because he, he feels so kind of guilty about about what's happened to um, to rob his nephew very sad that he, the detective's nephew who is one of the officers responding to the scene ends up getting shot and killed and it turns out that they were after very specific things in the safe deposit box uh vaults so not necessarily like i guess there's reference to that like oh they left a faberge egg Mm. but um they were targeting very specific numbered uh boxes it's kind of interesting how he brings to life some of the characters like the security guards um you get a real sense of the personality of of kind of like one of them who seems to be a very unsavory fellow with uh, shall we say with kind of various personal relations with young women and uh, uh, and he's kind of really vividly and unpleasantly brought to life and then dispensed of two pages later and um, one thing i would say about mckinty's writing is that in some of his earlier books he would kind of get obsessed with detail and kind of bringing in all the proper words for various different kind of technologies like particularly for historical detail with things like introducing various swords by their proper name but not necessarily explaining it so well whereas maybe because i am just kind of yeah because it's it's a more recognizable setting at least to me uh that uh, i didn't kind of i i didn't find it was uh it was kind of like bogged down in detail as much as some of his 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 earlier stuff mm-hmm um, thinking particularly of uh, of kind of like white darkness and uh, and and from what I remember of sanctuary. Yeah, white darkness especially was very descriptive, and I wonder if he had pulled in some of like research he had done about mm. Haiti as part of other um, another project maybe or something. Yeah, yeah. 
and maybe it might be just because I know these places and uh, because of business is set in. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Back to unit. Um, yes. Because the doctor's out of town and they had this plane crash, they need to find a different scientific advisor to come in and mm. uh, talk about it. And they um, mention, you know, bringing Liz Shaw back. And they, I, I liked the, uh, oh, we can't bring her back again because she helped us with that business with the glass house. Yes. Which, um, I forget which book that was. Scales and Justice, I believe. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so she's out on a lecture tour with Carl Sagan. Which must have been lovely. So uh, yeah, so that was that was quite cool. Really. Kind of like a celebrity non cameo. So the brig um, contacts uh, the uh, the RAE and and is uh, put in contact with one Ian Chesterton, who you will remember. And interestingly, um, Ian Chesterton is based at RAE Farnborough, which is next to where I used to live. Um, so um, that was. Uh, a rather strange kind of like twist that uh, I used to possibly, you know, used to live in the area that, um, that Ian and Barbara presumably live in, in the book. Uh, but uh, yeah. I have to say, I was so excited when um, Ian and Barbara show up in, in, I think it was like chapter three, because yeah. for me, it really made up for the doctor not being in the story to, to get them to come back. And they're married now, which is really interesting. And they have a, uh, hmm. a child together. Yes. Name. who goes on to reappear oh yes yeah so um he he so their their son uh johnny goes on to become a kind of like a a rock starry figure uh, known as johnny chess and uh, he uh, oh he ends up marrying tegan that's <laughs> uh, huh he, he just he appears in the background in a few different books um i think primarily in paul cornell books huh Wow, I I didn't connect those two things because yeah, I I vaguely remember Johnny Chess in a few of the new adventures I read, you know, mm. just kind of punk concerts and that sort of thing. Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, wow, no, I didn't. That's interesting. <laughs> yes. So Ian and Barbara are uh, Tegan's future in laws, uh, but uh, hey, that. Um... <laughs> Speaking of Tegan, mm. did you ever get like flashes to time flight with this whole? Uh... <laughs> Uh, plane and and I think like at one point later on in the story the the master mentions like oh I think I can improve on that sort of <laughs> like I I almost wonder if this is like a time flight origin story where, where the master gets the idea for that yes that, that wonderful story the highlight of the day to yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I wasn't until we started talking about um about kind of he froze like, oh yeah no it's it's time flight done right. So Ian and um, Barbara's coming along, um, decide to uh, to assist unit basically as, as attaches from the uh, the Air Force, right? Do they say at this point that they know the Doctor? I can't quite remember because like, the Brigadier does the Brigadier does realize that there is a connection. Um, yeah, I was wondering if they how long they were going to keep that going, but I think relatively soon after they're introduced, they realize that the Doctor's. The, the same doctor and they talk about the TARDIS and I think throughout they're thinking that it's you know the William Hartnell doctor that's helping unit <laughs> because I don't think yeah. that they know about the concept of regeneration at all no, no. but um yeah they, they do realize they're all um friends with the doctor yeah Ian kind of makes the real or comes to the realization that the material from the aircraft is radioactive mm. and we get someone showing up very quickly who wants to uh dismantle the scene and haul away all the evidence so <laughs> as you tend to get in in kind of unit stories you have the man from the ministry uh or in this case the minister uh appearing and just generally being uh, sort of um uh, very difficult and uh, and not at all suspicious so they end up carting away the the pieces of the plane they save a piece mm. and um while that's going on you know you, we, we're kind of cutting back and forth between that storyline and this um bank robbery which yeah. um also comes to the attention of of unit I'm trying to remember how come at quite how they get into the bank robbery because i mean i know that um i think it was because of the the master's um oh yeah, yeah. because he owns some of the safe deposit box yeah. um type thing and uh, and he's kind of going by the name of uh, of of kind of you know mr magister 
uh, here um, still, despite having kind of kind of got arrested at the end of the day once. And so he has a kind of like a, a, a criminal lawyer called um, Ross Grant, who uh, is, uh, he's more a criminal than a lawyer, I think it's fair to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he's, this guy, he's, he's, he's a bit of a kind of, yeah, he's a bit of a heavy, isn't he, really? Yeah. And no, no relation to Joe Grant either, that at first I thought that's where they were going with the same. Yeah, I did wonder that. Last name. Um, it, it, does seem a bit odd, but yeah. then again, I think Grant is more of a common surname than, say, Osgood. You get quite a few scenes of, uh, you know, detective work, following people, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And eventually the detective who's in- investigating this and kind of doing it on the side because because his uh, nephew... Because he's killed. in a 70s cop show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. and, 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 and because his, uh, his nephew is killed you know you have that conflict of interest thing so he's yeah kind of doing so he it gets a... taken off the case and uh, yeah he gets the full cagney and lacy kind of treatment mm-hmm. and he eventually figures out like the group that carried out the attack on the bank was a, a scottish group so he's kind of following that trail and mm. um kind of taking it where where it leads him and and the master is also uh he uh, he's got um the, the lawyer ross grant uh, getting his own subordinates to kind of investigate um, uh, kind of uh, what's happening. I should say the master also has an accountant. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, he does. Mariana Kyle, mm. and, um, or Marianne Kyle is her name. And I, I couldn't help it, but with the last name Kyle, I, I just kept picturing like Selena Kyle from yes. <laughs> DC Comics in, in my head in, in terms of yeah. the, the character, but. Well, she, she um, uh, we we first see her in the uh, in the bank raid, um, where she's kind of um, dressed in. I think she's dressed in a cat suit or something. I mean, she's only kind of dressed in kind of sort of like full on burglary gear, uh, and she she's got kind of got almost like a Diana Rigg kind of um, vibe going. If you're familiar with the TV series The Avengers, we'll keep an eye on her. Is uh, she'll keep on reappearing. Back at Unit, uh, Barbara gets. Um, assigned to go interview someone who is involved in the um, the plane appearing and the yeah. there was like a UFO sighted, so they're thinking that it might be UFO related. So mm. she's trying to do some investigation yeah. and follow up on those leads. And because she's going to speak to the MP, so the MP whose body has been found, but is but he is still alive, and uh, so the brigadier has uh, decided. That um, of all people, Barbara is a good person to go and uh, have a gentle word, and uh, uh, but she kind of goes in to see him just after he's had a visit from Marianne Kyle, and so he himself has ended up dead, and uh, and and Barbara is kind of all quite kind of shocked. I mean, one of the things this book's quite a good character piece about Ian and Barbara, and also I think it's fair to say if you have any interest in reading this book, if you're enjoying what we're saying so far uh, in our own Rambi way, uh, I think we are going to spoil this. There's no easy way to guess we get around it, and so do do please make sure you kind of go and and and, and read it because uh, I mean I think yeah it, it, it's quite twisty, it's quite turny, and it's quite fun. Yeah, about Barbara. Uh, so she's. You, you you do kind of you, you do see how traumatic TARDIS travel would have been for them both and their various adventures and everything because um, quite often Ian uh, and Barbara are kind of reflecting upon their various near death experiences with the Doctor and kind of like radiation and and all, all manner of other uh, unpleasantness uh, that they've encountered as well as the kind of like the fun times. Uh, and so you could have saw possibly a bit more depth to their characters than um, than, than I'd seen in, in, to be frank, in some of the um, you know the past slash missing Doctor adventures I've read featuring the two of them. Um, is, uh, I think they kind of come across quite well as as kind of actual people. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, anyway, sorry, I digress. No, I think that's a that's a great point. I think the he gets the characterization of those characters in particular down really well um i almost wish you would have done a little bit more with the brigadier um, mm. in terms of characterization we get a few interesting moments with him and including um mention of kate his daughter yes which yes. is cool yeah i, I felt this especially with ian and barbara um mckinty really fleshed them out in terms of mm. 
their motivations. We've had the murder of the MP, and um, and so um, so Di um, uh, Boucher or Butcher or however we're pronouncing it um, has been assigned um, uh, to the case uh, because that's nothing to do with the um, the murder of his nephew, uh, and uh, so. Uh, and the brigadier kind of gets Barbara to kind of um, to help him out because uh, he can't kind of like divulge too much because of kind of national security uh, and, uh, and 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 whatnot. And uh, we also get the brigadier visiting the master mm. um, around uh, right around this point uh, just to yes. ask him for help because I think they realize that you know with with a potential UFO involved that they could be dealing with mm -hmm. off-world invaders and they and they want to uh, get his consultation <laughs> uh, yes well while, while the doctor's <laughs> away so they yeah. visit him this is where we have our dramatic reading for the month courtesy of you Chris right yes indeed uh, um, <laughs> this is all a bit timey wimey this episode <laughs> so uh, we'll see how my recording has gone There's an intercom next to the door in case of need, Conran reminded the brigadier. You know the drill. With that, he stood back and let the visitors enter. The master's prison was more like a hotel's luxury suite, complete with comfortable furniture, TV, stereo, bookshelves, even a drinks cabinet. Then, he remembered, the secure accommodation here had been intended for protective custody of valuable defectors. Presumably Fortress Island would be more fitting when its refurbishment was complete. The master was waiting for them, having been notified of a visit by Conran. My brigadier, he began warmly, I hardly expected you to visit me in my present circumstances. But you're very welcome, of course, and Captain Yates and... He stopped at Chester. Don't believe I've had the pleasure. Ian Chesterton. I'm pleased to meet you. Something of inevitability since I have so few visitors at all. Turn back to the brigadier. But the master looked vaguely puzzled for a moment. Where is the doctor? Hasn't he come along for a little gloat? The doctor is busy, left Bruce Stewart answered, and could see that the master didn't really believe them. Well, in that case, I shall make do, the master suggested to the chairs and city. Please make yourselves comfortable. I prefer to stand, if it's all the same to you, left Bruce Stewart said firmly. He didn't come here for the master to play mother to them. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see Yates start to move to a chair, then stop in deference to his superior's ideals. This isn't a social cause, it happens. Somehow, I didn't think it would be. It wasn't making things any easier, the Brigadier thought. This was embarrassing enough as it was. As a matter of fact, we came to... Damn, but he didn't really want to say this. Well, to ask for your help. The Master was somewhat taken aback. My help? After imprisoning me? You have a rather strange sense of humour, Brigadier. Then consider it community service. Reparations for the trouble you've caused. I'm sure we can arrange some sort of... He looks round the plush apartment. Privileges in return. The master was clearly sceptical, and Lethbridge Stewart could hardly blame him. Very well, Brigadier. What kind of help? The master affected a sigh. We'd like access to your TARDIS. The master blinked, then spread his hands. But of course. Give me my freedom, and I'll give you all the help you need. You know I can't do that, Lethbridge Stewart said wearily. Naturally, no more than I could give you my TARDIS. While Lethbridge Stewart hit back the reply he was about to make, Ian broke in. All we need is some equipment that will allow us to test whether some samples we have in the lab have travelled in time. The master gave him a sideway glance. Such equipment is standard fitting in every TARDIS. Why not simply use the doctors? Lethbridge Stewart tried to think of a reasonable reply, clearly it took too long and a slow smile spread across the master's features. You can't, can you? That's why he isn't here. Somehow he's got that old crock of his working again that has left the planet. Lethbridge Stewart thought about lying, but knew the conversation had gone beyond the point where that would work. He nodded. The master laughed. So that's it. Other helpers fail. 
Comfort flee, and you come to me. Lefford Stewart gritted his teeth. The master was enjoying us, but no doubt milked the situation for all it was worth. Why should I help you, Brigadier? Why help my enemy? Why not? Lefford Stewart had no other answer to give, except perhaps. The doctor says that even now you're still a scientist. Aren't you curious? The master relented slightly. Hmm, you've hit upon my one uncropped advice. Yeah, alright, I'm curious. Tell me exactly what your problem is, and I'll consider it. So when uh, Brigadier went to the master, the master basically kind of refused to to help them, really. Yes. Um, so they 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 leave um, kind of dejected and so uh, so the brigadier is also he's he's kind of very suspicious of uh, of of the minister that was ordering that plane to be scrapped and so uh, he's got um, one of his lieutenants uh, lieutenant Beresford who I don't remember from the TV series maybe he is a kind of an existing TV unit character uh, but Beresford is kind of um, um, sort of watching Carswell. And uh, then finds him kind of meeting up um, with some kind of underworld figures in Trafalgar Square. I don't know, that doesn't seem to be like the kind of place where you'd hang out and meet. Apart from in a TV series. In a TV series, that's where, you know, it's it's always prominent landmarks. Yeah, because in real life, apparently uh, in the 70s, uh, sort of spies and stuff were quite often meeting in supermarkets around here, uh, which is nice. That must have been a nice time to be living in this area. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so Soviet skullduggery um, over by the um, the fruit and veg. Uh, anyway, uh, they are kind of arranging for more of Kyle's people to be kind of brought over. That we're starting to hear there's some kind of connections with um, the Royal Navy's um, submarine base up in Fast Lane which is uh, up in Scotland. Yeah, we do get a few Scottish references in this book. That does help me, because geography-wise, I was kind of lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, at that point, they learned that the re- the recording of the, the plane was uh, was faked, and that the transmission had bits of uh, Big Ben chimes in the background. That just sounds inept, doesn't it? Um, yeah. You thought that if you're kind of faking a transmission, it's kind of, I, I, I don't know. It sounds like the kind of thing that would happen in Magnum PI, uh, that you suddenly hear a kind of like a, a bell in the background and go, oh, they must be down at the harbour. I wonder if it was a... Uh, Deliberate? Just, yeah, like an homage <laughs> yes. to... There wasn't there a um, an episode of The Prisoner where that was like the reveal that the the chimes of Big Ben were were what um yes i think there is the one old... there is one called the chimes yeah. of big ben isn't there yeah i think that it might might have been a reference yeah, to that but... yeah could well be uh, but also it's a kind of reference to kind of like 70s cop shows where this kind of thing happens quite a bit the uh the detective mm. goes up you know he he hears about the this the scottish gang that was hired mm. by the for you know for the bank robbery and also the the scottish um submarine base yes so he goes up there to investigate yeah he gets discovered on the base and as he's fleeing he gets uh struck and killed by a uh motorist just randomly on the on the freeway yes um or the highway motorway motorway, motorway. <laughs> that's yes. that's the term <laughs> yeah <laughs> and like yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm like u.s term u.s term UK term. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, he gets struck by the motorway and someone just happens to wander by and and find him uh, yes and uh that someone is described as kind of square jawed and sort of uh, is, is <laughs> it, it's harry sullivan um and which which is a nice pleasant surprise um but i, I didn't recognize him from the description but i recognize him from the dialogue because uh, um, he doesn't quite say oh hang on there old bean uh, but uh, it's not far off it so like, oh that's got because he talks about oh I'm a naval surgeon but that's got to be Harry uh, so uh, yeah we get a, a at this point future companion of the doctor uh, rocky up in this story uh, the detective inspector at this point is he's, he's dying and uh, and his last words are to kind of uh, get word to um, to Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. Mm-hmm. I thought that was quite a brilliant t- twist because I was kind of expecting it, him to kind of be more of a character uh, in, in in the novel, but I guess it would have just been guessing 
it, oh, it, you know, it was a bit ridiculous him kind of being taken off the case and finding another thread to link him in and to just it's like no let's just take him off the table and um and and, and bring in harry it was, it was quite good even if it was a bit brutal i'm not a huge fan of harry sullivan i guess the the character i always thought he was a bit a bit superfluous you know in his season yeah i i do like the the dynamic he brings but you know he's so rooted in that kind of old boy mentality Mm. that he just was never a favorite of mine however i like him a lot better after reading this book yeah (laughs) he's a proto rory in the in the in the tv series Uh, but here he kind of feels more yeah more his own man but yeah, and he's also in one of my favourite bits of um, of of that first season, Tom Baker. Um, in fact, the only good bit of Revenge of the Cybermen, uh, when uh, when the fourth Doctor sort of yells, "Harry Sullivan's an imbecile," uh, was <laughs> that effect. Uh, but, uh, yeah, oh, I like Harry. I have time for Harry. Um, yeah. but, uh, anyway, so we digress. So Marianne Kyle at this point decides to um, send um, one of her agents to kind of go and dispose of the master who is kind of, he, you know, he's still in his prison uh, and uh, and, the, and it then becomes quite apparent that the master has hypnotised the entire prison staff and he's just there because it's convenient for him to still be in the prison. Um, and, uh, and there's kind of a uh, spectacular, you know, action sequence yes. where the helicopter lands and start mowing down the guards mm. who are all lined up there to you know greet the the helicopter landing mm. and the you have the master basically you know exiting out of his tower avoiding the firefight kind of going and and hopping in the helicopter <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> circling around behind yeah. and uh taking off in it <laughs> yeah it's very mind of evil uh, i can imagine sort of tim coombs directors it's 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 a brilliant piece uh, as, as i said before if you enjoy you if you're enjoying this so far stop listening to us read the book oh so he's he flies the helicopter mm. to pay a visit to uh i want to say selena kyle but yes. it's marianne kyle yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh to his accountants which is who was you know had sent the crews after him to 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 kidnap him in the first place yes and and she has knowledge too that he's a time lord yes because also... i don't know if she she knows what that means necessarily but Oh, I think she does. I think she does. Because um, um, she she definitely seems to kind of know from fairly early on that, well, at least that the master is alien. Mm. Uh, she definitely knows that. Um, so, uh, and also uh, at this point, uh, she's she's kind of, well, at this point, Ross Grant starts to kind of exit the scene. She doesn't she kill him at about this point? Yeah, she one of several people that she uh, <laughs> kind of kills that that have been working for her. Yes. She's 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 been kind of the mastermind behind all of this yeah. and has hired hired the various gangs against each other. And, yes. Um, What's a surprise? People that the master go into business with turn out to be just as evil and betray them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a shock! That doesn't like happen all of the time. Uh, but... <laughs> She also steals the Master's TARDIS, which at this point is disguised as, I think, a... Uh... Rolls-Royce, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he driving around in a Rolls-Royce at the start of the Mind of Evil? Yeah. One one thing to keep in mind, too, with this is if you're at all familiar with, you know, the, the structure of where this fits in terms of Curse of Peladon and where the Master is imprisoned at the start of the story and, you know, his very next appearance, mm. there's, there's kind of a, a feeling that I that I got as, you know, reading this, that, you know, by the end of the story, the toys have to be put back on their shelf in the same place yeah. you know, that they were. Uh, so I always, even though the master escapes prison, I, you, in the back of your mind, if you're familiar with the season, you, you kind of think like, uh, by the end of the story, he probably has to end up back in prison. Or I think they even make reference to, uh, at, at one point in the story, like, where he uh, escapes from is just a temporary yes, it cell is. because they're they're preparing like the island fortress that yes. we get in uh, the Sea Devils. I think. Yes, it's a, yeah, yeah. Which I think is the is the very next story chronologically. You also kind of get the feeling as well from the brigadier's kind of dealings with the um, the, the people running the prison that the master kind of ends up escaping from um, that. Um, unit are just so weary of them and that this is probably not the first kind of 
panic that unit have had regarding kind of prison security there if if you knew of the master uh, you would be very nervous and wary of him because i mean he is this kind of evil cypriot um, kind of mastermind. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so that, yes, of course, someone called Magister would be a Cypriot. Yes. Okay. The the master and uh, Marianne Kyle, you know, have that exchange, and then he escapes, and mm. he eventually tracks. He's he's trying to get a better understanding of what's going on as well. Yeah. Because even though he could leave, you know, the the prison, he he's not quite understanding what's all going on with this invasion plan and it isn't something that he's behind so he's trying to get to the get to the bottom of it and he ends up i think killing a few more people yes but but he eventually finds his way um to unit headquarters in the doctor's laboratory kind of going through his stuff and yes yeah. he comes across um the devices that were used in uh day of the doctor yeah which which are not unlike the uh kind of the belts that um they had in what was the new series where they would jump you know between pete's world and rise of the cybermen the uh yeah the inner interdimensional belts mm -hmm. those sorts of things yeah. he takes one of those from from day of the the daleks mm -hmm. and he starts dismantling it or enhancing it and mm -hmm. um building a device that'll help him figure out what's been going on because barbara suspects there's some sort of time travel involved because yeah. of uh you know the residue being not unlike that of primordial earth yes which which <laughs> is also a, yeah back to time flight okay. at this point too um something very extraordinary mm -hmm. happens with barbara well because um, we should talk yeah di Bush, boucher butcher uh suddenly reappears and uh and he he hasn't found anything up at fast line um and uh but then i can't remember what he says but he's it's suddenly kind of like makes it abundantly clear that uh, he's an imposter um he then kind of takes barbara as a hostage and uh, they go on the run um uh, from unit hq and there's a kind of big old kind of car chase he crashes the car kills a homeless woman who just happens to look a little bit like barbara and um, and burns her body to uh, make it seem as if Barbara has died. Including, yeah, and this this part I thought was a little, it kind of crossed the line for me in terms of, like, gruesomeness that was, you know, because you have the scene of him, like, tearing the wedding ring off Barbara's yeah. finger and, you know, taking her shoes and putting, you know, putting mm. them with the body. And it was it was very, um, felt, felt much more Torchwood than Doctor Who. Yeah, it was a big grim. Uh, and also kind of, a little bit unnecessary. I mean, it would have been more realistic for him to have just killed Barbara, um, which I think would have been... Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to see that, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, uh, I don't, it, however, uh, the fact that she's kind of apparently died now kind of serves as a as, as a motivation uh, for, for Ian. And well, Ian, I mean, he's just, he's just devastated. And we then see this... Uh, it's quite chilling and shocking scene in which he's just kind of standing on a ledge um, at, at units and he's just kind of considering just jumping and he's kind of because yeah, and he, he, he's kind of making assessments as to how painful his death would be um, from from this high up uh, and um, and inadvertently it's the master that saves him mm, mm -hmm. and there's there's a rod of I don't know whether it justifies the um, the whole kind of like you know, Barbara is dead storyline, but there is there, there is a beautiful scene in which kind of like the master kind of talks through uh, his kind of it, yeah basically kind of talks him through his emotions, uh, and though it's made quite clear that the master is doing this just because um, he feels that Lethbridge Stewart would not trust him at all if uh, if Ian dies. Uh, in his vicinity uh, but yeah it's it's quite a i find that quite quite a, a powerful scene but also it's kind of undercut by um by kind of like when ian walks away and leaves the room that the master just kind of gives a look of disdain uh at kind of ian's emotional state I and mean, it's so so you kind of know he's not mr nice guy he is just he he's using him for his and you get a lot of you get a 
tie back to the the previous novel McGinty wrote to the dark path where um his companion i think alia or ilea i'm not sure how to pronounce it but um similar sort of circumstances where you know her death or apparent death um it turns out she's revealed well i won't spoil it in case <laughs> <laughs> listeners haven't heard it but um she's she's not dead and but she betrays the master in in some way mm -hmm. and um it was that betrayal that kind of turned him from koshe or koshi mm -hmm. into the master in that previous book and and you get some strong having read the two back to back there's there's quite a few strong parallels in that scene you, you're almost wondering if it's the the master talking to ian or you know the master talking to himself in terms of working through yeah some of that that guilt and and, and yeah it's a really really great scene mm -hmm. and soon after the master learns that barbara is not in fact dead um there was an autopsy done on the body and you know she's still alive but he decides um, not to share that information with Ian. Yeah, because he's just wanted to play him. Yeah. Um, and uh, Barbara uh, has kind of uh, she she's kind of come around in a um, in a world where there's been some kind of natural disaster. She's so people are kind of traveling um, through some kind of dimensional arch. She's now being kind of interrogated by uh, by Kyle. And who has kind of sent her to this organization called the Conclave uh, for uh, for yeah, yet more interrogation. So. And at that point, um, the master he's so the the submarine base mm. up in um, Scotland, S yeah, Pat's Scotland, life. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he's detecting like energy readings mm. there, so they they know that something's happening there, and I think that's when. Uh, the brigadier also hears from Harry, you know, letting him know that the real um, inspector had the DI uh, Boucher had had died. So all roads really point to Scotland. Mm. So I think that's where everyone starts heading. Yeah, and uh, and then Boucher's body disappears from the morgue. Harry gets in kind of like a fight sequence with um, with various kind of um, sort of uh, naval staff uh, in the morgue who are clearly all. Uh, sort of under the pay or control of Kyle. Yeah, Harry manages to kind of get away and uh, lets lets the brig know that uh, that there's some kind of bad stuff going down in Fastline. And then, uh, well, that's happening too. I think it's uh, Sergeant Benton, uh, Captain Yates, and Ian. Mm. They all use the device that the master built to jump. You, you know, to to try and figure out where where this invasion is coming from yeah and they're they're kind of like in a like a dusty uh desert like environment mm. and they see a space shuttle kind of pass overhead <laughs> and, and land so they're they're wondering what what in the world's going on yes. it's kind of a weird weird sight to see especially with i think at the time nasa was you know just testing the enterprise prototype the the first space shuttle so they weren't even really flying at this time yeah. so they're amazed that that that's happening they they managed to kind of get back to uh, uh, to fast line and they let the um, you know, they tell the brigadier and the master what's been happening because also the brigadier is refusing to let the master kind of go across because he's going like yeah no i've got you under control here <laughs> I, because the master is like oh i'm an expert on time travel surely i'll be best place like, uh, yeah, no pal, you stay where you are. And uh, the brigadier kind of thinks it it rings a slight bell and asks for a file. Do you refer to it as the East Chester incident? Is it East Chester? And, uh, anyway, it's basically he's starting to think that it might be like what happened in Inferno. <laughs> and and this is the uh, the uh, kind of the big reveal yeah. of the of the whole book, which really caught me by surprise. Mm. Like I had no idea this was was coming, but and it happens about close to 80 percent you know into the book yeah. where you get this reveal that yeah this whole book is a sequel to inferno <laughs> 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 which which was a huge surprise yeah. and, and shocking to me well I, I did say last time that this was a sequel to something didn't i you did <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and, uh, not the sequel I... you were expecting no <laughs> 
Mm. We we learn it we learn in short order that there's there's only one dimensional gateway in between the inferno world and you know the the doctor's timeline yeah. or the you know the the quote unquote real world and that happens to be at that submarine base in fa- in fast lane. Yeah. That's where the arch is and you had this the plane that came through was really an attempt at um, crossing over in a different way, which didn't work, and that's why it crashed. And uh, the the guy on board who was the counterpart in this that's that's where these they, you know they they aren't Zygons, they aren't Autons, mm-hmm. they're they're really um, kind of fascist humans. Yes, <laughs> from from this this parallel mirror mirror sort of world and mirror mirror gets a reference as well because benton talks about uh, oh isn't it like that star trek episode where uh, they all kind of uh, wear goatee beards um or worse than that effect um or or eye patches in this case. yes yeah and I, I don't know i i can't imagine benton as someone that watches star trek uh, mm. i just thought he'd be just more of a kind of like a you know football and rugby kind of guy uh hey ho um, <laughs> but, uh, it, it was really popular at the time i think especially in the yeah the early 70s where you'd have I've, I hear stories all the time about like college dorms you mm. know the the one tv you know tuned into star trek this every is day true. that's this is true but also i don't know i personally i i don't tend to watch too many things kind of set in the field of work that i work in uh and uh i, mean, I, I guess yeah and star trek might be this a bit close to home to uh to the kind of shenanigans that benton has to put up with on a kind of a weekly basis i don't know oh yeah that's very true <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah we get that that big reveal mm-hmm. that the um inferno earth they're trying to move the survivors over to and not just this i wouldn't say all survivors really just the you know, like the, the military elites mm-hmm. trying to uh replace them and mm-hmm. you know their counterparts don't necessarily always have the same sort of position you know like some of them are both military or government related but like in the case of di boucher Um, His counterpart, I think, was in the military and not, you know, like a peaceful police force, which makes sense given the different um, timelines and and how that might play out. That's basically the the plan is, you know, that they're slowly but surely replacing everyone. Mm. And, you know, it's been discovered. And Mm. so it's up to the unit and the master to to stop it. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, so the master kind of takes it upon himself to to kind of... um, trying to kind of get over there and kind of grab his grab his TARDIS and uh, the Brigadier and Ian uh, end up kind of like by accident coming along with him as well. So they, it's not quite at this point where they go to the Conclave yet, is it? Um, but it's not far off it. So um, the Master kind of ends up turning himself in to, um, to Kyle uh, and uh, he's sort of saying that uh, he's kind of come to assist her and, uh, and just to show his loyalty, he kind of basically gives her uh, you know, it's Brigadier and Ian, yeah, because he's 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 a nasty piece of work, isn't he, the master? He also, I think, whispers to to Ian that, or not to Ian, to the Brigadier, that he's going to. Um... Oh no, I'm I'm confusing something earlier. I don't think you was... are. No, I think it's around because the um, well, the master makes it slightly clear to the Brig that he's got some kind of other plan. And, and uh, there's a kind of there's a gun in the brigadier's cell. Oh, that's right. Yep, he trips off to the moon. <laughs> yeah, this is where it gets a, uh, you know. Yes. <laughs> the introduction of the submarine base. Yes. All of a sudden, you have the yes. spy who loves me going yes. on. Yeah. And now we uh, we add Moonraker to the mix. Yeah. So the uh, the space shuttle that they saw earlier is one of a couple that Kyle and. The others in the conclave, which is like the remnants of the totalitarian kind of world order, they have a couple of space shuttles laying around <laughs> that they've retrofitted yes. with uh, technology from Delta and the Bannerman. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, 1959 invasion of Wales. Do, do, do we have to reference that? Of all the things. From from that, they're able to get to the moon in just a couple of hours instead of you know the three days it would normally take. 
to uh, to get there. Uh, we also get a Web of Fear reference around about here as well, which makes an awful lot of more sense. Uh, but uh, and and also um, the the Tzun get referenced as who who were from uh, McKinty's First Frontier book, um, as uh, they were kind of uh, basically in Area Fifty One. And we find out what happens to the alternate version of the master remind me so in, in in inferno the doctor had died right or he i'm trying to think what happened to the doctor in this timeline yeah because he, he suddenly he isn't around it's made very clear yeah so he, he, yeah he's he suddenly he's not about but the master finds um koshe or um koshi uh and he's been kind of stranded on earth basically kind of like being tortured isn't he and, and uh, he's a prisoner and he's also down to his uh, his final regeneration. Yep, and his tar- his TARDIS was destroyed in the Web of Fear that you mentioned just a bit ago. And uh, and, and and he's in he's in agony. So uh, kind of reminding me a bit of Barusa um, from uh, Engines of War. Uh, he, he, it's, it's 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 all very grim and all very sad because uh, I mean he he's the kind of this is the the pure version of the master, the, the one that who never kind of um, went, yeah, who took the dark path. Yeah, and, and it does have an effect on our master, seeing uh, seeing his alternative self. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that that's another, mm-hmm. um, I, I would say, another kind of like powerful thing. I don't know if he's still playing both sides. I think he's, I think he's intent on, yeah, especially after meeting his alternate self, like he's intent on taking these people down, you know, for, for torturing him or a version of him. He, uh, says he's going to go off to interrogate Barbara about something, but instead he <laughs> helps her escape and uh, says, hey, can you get into this space suit? And he ch- ch- chucks her out the airlock and says, try and break in farther down to create a distraction. I wish there would have been a moment when Barbara's, you know, walking on the moon by yeah. herself. Um, I wish there was a moment there where she just kind of took it all in especially since her and Ian got back Mm -hmm. to earth in time, you know, for the moon shot and presumably the Mars shot if ambassadors of death happened, there was just wasn't a moment, you know, where she's maybe she's walked on the moon before with the first doctor, who knows? Maybe she's also in shock and just generally just trying to, because I mean, it's, it's, it's been a bit of a day. Um... (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Here I am thinking, oh, maybe she'll just sit and take it all in for a second, but she's got other things on her mind. <laughs> so one thing that, that this book does is it really kind of, it, it fills in a bit more of the kind of the detail of the alternative universe from Inferno is uh, you find out about um, uh, Stalin's White Russia. And here I was thinking it was a drink. Didn't think that the White Russians were on Stalin's side, but uh, hey-ho. Uh, and uh, they... <laughs> yes, uh, they and uh, and kind of a fascist Britain had kind of like divided up Europe, and basically Hitler didn't happen because uh, all the fascists, all the fascism and stuff um, happened in the UK, and there's a Confederacy of America, and uh, yeah, it's all quite. Uh, there's also isn't there, there's a kind of like an Asian Pacific Federation. Um, so yeah, we, we we find out just more details, and, it, and obviously McKinsey's having a bit of fun with uh, with kind of like playing the Harry Turtledove game. Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, I'm not too sure that it makes it, it it makes much sense, but it just kind of adds a little bit adds a little bit more to it. And so I think it's quite yeah, it's 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 quite nice to find out a bit more about about that world's history. Barbara's creating a distraction out on the the moon. The master kills uh, or puts Koshe out of his misery. Really, um, yeah, does the humane yeah. thing yeah, and does kill him. Uh, yeah. kills him, and then. Uh, Barbara and the master at this point go back down to earth right but yeah. but it's still the infernal earth yes yeah uh, and uh, they find that the um, the brigadier and Ian have managed to kind of uh, ha- have, have escape so Ian is uh, is now kind of he, he he's he's now found uh, butcher and uh, and is fighting him Ian has an opportunity to kill him but sort of can't bring himself to in the moment. But the master just rocks up and then just, yeah, you know, just kills Butcher, just straight away, and and mocks Ian. Ian's still 
is under the impression that Barbara's dead at this point too, right? Yeah. So this was, you know, him faced with Barbara's killer, and yet he still refused to take yes. a life. And I, I also wondered, did we ever see Ian kill anyone in... Like, did he kill any of the Aztecs? He throws, um, he throws the Aztec champion off, doesn't he, presumably to his death, off the edge of the temple, doesn't he? Yeah. So maybe it's not the first... I mean, so presumably he's killed in self-defense, but in this case, he just couldn't do it. Well, and also he's so emotionally distraught as well, because, I mean, he really is put through the ringer in, in, in this book. Because, I mean, it is, whilst it's a kind of, like, yeah, as we've said before, whilst it's a unit book... This really is an Ian and Barbara book, particularly an Ian book. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, I I just felt so sorry for him quite often. And it's complete emotional manipulation by the master too, right? Because the master's really, throughout the book, kind of playing him like an instrument almost. And to, Mm. to get the reactions that he wants and to get the motivation that he wants is he's really using Ian. He's not hypnotizing him, but he, he may as well have done because he's, really put him through the ringer like as you said yeah and uh, and also the master kind of um, attempts to justify um, um to Ian the fact that he's been lying about about barbara being dead uh, by just sort of saying that look you're, you're far more effective uh, working in grief than uh, you would have been if you were scared of putting her at risk and uh, and it's chilling logic as well because it kind of yeah yeah you, you don't want to I don't know. I, I didn't want to kind of acknowledge that yeah, there is logic in there. There is. And, and I'm just like, oh, you are just so evil. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. so then, then it kind of wraps up relatively quickly after that. Yeah. You get uh, the master destroying the, the gateway so that they can't um, cross over anymore. Everybody kind of heads back to um, uh, to kind of like to fast lane. Then the master um, sort of manages to, um, he, he tries to kind of, um, he tries to escape again. They're able to cross over back to the regular mm. Earth, either through a combination of, yes. you know, the gateway as it's being destroyed, and then also the um, little jumper device that, you know, the master had built from the day of the Dalek parts. Mm. But they're, <laughs> they're, everyone's able to get to, quote unquote, the real Earth. And um, yeah, Kyle is... She crosses over too, right? So they're they're still not quite done. Yeah, and she's trying to escape on the on the submarine because most of the that crew had been replaced at this point. So they have yeah. they have one Polaris sub kind of under their control. Yeah, it's it's interesting all the focus on Polaris because uh, the, um, the 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 missile system that that eventually replaces that in real life um, is uh, very much a an election hot topic. Oh, uh, as, as we record this, oh. yes, yes, it's, uh, the uh, as the the leader of the opposition is is uh, very much against um, the nuclear subs. Hmm. So Doctor Who, timely as ever. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes. But then uh, they're able to um, stop the submarine before it leaves the the dock. Um, hmm. Mike Yates and Harry Sullivan. Uh, take a take a like a little boat out to the sub before it starts going underwater and they open up an emergency hatch um, kind of preventing it from from sinking and then the master Mm. materializes on there on the on the ship his TARDIS turns into like a like a hatchway in as part of the wall of the the submarine and um yeah. tries to tries to escape but he's he's cornered and earlier he kind of palms a little remote device you know as he's leaving his TARDIS and he's able to get it to dematerialize so unit can't catch it and this is kind of what I ties into you know the putting the toys back on the shelf where they mm. the belong sort of thing yeah. he sends the his TARDIS back to uh Devil's End <laughs> yes. where it'll remain <laughs> yeah in the ruined church and he uh, gets yeah, taken yeah, back into custody, yeah. but um, uh, mm. Marianne Kyle she escapes. The master's kind of he he allows her to escape right because he he finds it yeah. uh, worse that she's stranded on a world without a home yes. as opposed to uh, having yeah. any resources. Yeah, because there's some real malice there. 
um, where he yeah, says about, you know, she's having to be living as a kind of a fugitive, kind of homeless, no allies. And you kind of think, yeah, a bit like you, though, mate. Hey, yeah, yeah, it's 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 nasty. And That's then the uh, the master gets taken into custody, and uh, the doctor and Joe show up at the end, and they say, hey, <laughs> yes, did we miss anything? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, the brigadier says, oh, yes. not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not really, and, and and then Joe starts telling him about Alpha Centauri, or at least in my head she does. Uh, but... Yeah, that does line up really nicely, you know, where the Brigadier kind of pauses and he says, you know, you didn't miss anything or didn't miss much. I forget the exact line, but if, if it seems like it took us a long time to recap that one, it's uh, yeah. it's because it, because there was a lot going on. It was yes. uh, very intricate. You had layers and layers of kind of James Bond um, plotting. Mm. I guess. So what did you think of it? I loved it. Uh, I, I kind of felt I would. Yeah. Uh, this for me definitely stood up. I kind of think, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of continuity, but it doesn't bog it down. I don't think. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, even if you never watched a unit story, I think you could probably enjoy it. Um, I mean, certainly you would get a lot more from it but uh it, it is just a fantastic read um and it just kind of goes along at, you know, at such a terrific pace I and mean, you, you have you, you've got these kind of brilliant twists and also yeah it is it, it's, it's this interesting mix of genres because you get all of the kind of you know uh you know the, the kind of life on mars style cop stuff at the start and uh, it it kind of felt real in a way that quite often some of the unit stories don't i mean it reminds me a lot you know the better to my mind unit stories you know the ambassadors of death the inferno sort of this certainly ticked all the boxes for me i, I, I just i just thought it was i thought it was fab i yeah I, I enjoyed it as well thinking back to the the question that sean asked last month you know would this make a good episode of the tv show mm. i here i'd say no i don't think it'd make i think it would make a good movie in the vein of like a yes. like a torchwood two-hour movie sort of thing it just it mm. because it was grittier and like you said based more in kind of that real world it didn't feel mm. so much doctor who to me as it did like a torchwood unit sort of and i keep saying torchwood even though you know they're not mentioned whatsoever in the this happened yeah. you know years before they were even invented but in terms of tone and and kind of grittiness and style that's what it felt like to me i i enjoyed it it just it wasn't and i and i wouldn't expect it to be you know on the nose doctor who because it, it was more of a mm. like you said a almost like a companion piece for ian and barbara yeah and, and unit um uh, but i i thoroughly enjoyed it there was a whole subplot we forgot to mention too involving uh corporal bell so she yes, she shows yes. up again and her brother i think is is being held hostage and yeah. she's turns into this mole and she's funneling information to uh Marianne Kyle's organization there there's so much continuity but it's it's so it's referenced in such a way where if you get the reference it's great and if you don't it doesn't detract from from the story at all yeah yeah it, it's the anti-John Peel <laughs> uh, I would say, I would yeah. say but, yeah 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 it, it, uh, yeah it's great it's great in terms of how we would rate this um <laughs> do you want to do you want to go first so real quick thinking back to the dark path you know the one that i, I mm. kind of read on my own extra and the the classic doctor who podcast they both gave that a nine and i would have given that an eight and i feel like had they reviewed this one okay they would have both given it a nine mm. and i i likewise i think i would mm. i would i would rate this one an eight and it's a strong eight yeah. Um, and it almost ticks a nine for me, but there was just a little too much of, I think, over-egging the pudding in that, like, mm. I, I felt like, you know, having the big finale on the submarine would have been enough, but that they threw in, you know, the, the moon base on top of that, um, <laughs> it, that, that sort of thing, um, yeah. you know, you could, could have maybe done with half a dozen fewer continuity references and maybe one fewer twists. I guess I'm in a way I'm sort of docking it for being slightly over ambitious, <laughs> but, um, it, it, uh, it, it, it really did well. I, th I thought I, so I give it a strong eight. And I wonder how much some of that was due to possible lack of confidence as to how much of a, how gripping it would be 
because of the fact it doesn't have the doctor in as a draw. Mm. Um, but because when this is the only from the novels, at least that I can think of, that goes down the Doctor Light route. Um, oh no, there's another, there's another birthright for the new adventures. That that's quite Doctor Light. But but I mean, to the extent though, where where you know, yeah, the, the Doctor is just in it for maybe a couple of pages, if that. Is that the one that takes place concurrently with the? Uh, is it Iceberg? The yes. Yeah. So, How would you rate this one? How do I rate this one? Uh, it's a nine. Yeah. It's. I'm not going to give it. A t- yeah. I'm not going to give it a ten because I think ten has to be something absolutely spectacular, and 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 I think also possibly maybe it might have been. Yeah. I, I could have possibly done without the kind of the Barbara being dead mm. storyline, but that does lead into that brilliant master scene. It's 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 just great because I'm. I'm I'm so glad that I enjoyed it because I I I, cause I read it sort of um uh, yeah I've only read it once before and that was shortly after it came out and uh, my taste at the time I I've, I've generally been disappointed by revisiting things in that time period because <laughs> I went really I enjoyed this um but uh, yeah my, uh, my 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 teenage self was was spot on with this one. Uh, I... It's nice when you can come across the things that hold up after. <laughs> <laughs> when you revisit them yeah later on yeah one of the things i really liked about this too are all the just the little mm. world building details in the parallel earth when the uh the base is under attack at first the um parallel earth people think it's like a mm. a primord attack which would make sense you know it would almost be like a zombie sort of yeah thing um so like details like that or all the different you know past unit headquarters yeah. getting a mention including at one point they're on the flying plane from um the Troughton stories and you get the the scene where like ian goes into the master's tardis and he's comparing yeah notes about you know the differences and like oh my gosh this tardis has an armory and mm. the doctors would never have that and you get those sort of details which really help like you like you said earlier mm. root this in the real world um or the real doctor who world as it were yeah because also the master's tardis has these kind of cold noises and uh, it's compared to the kind of like, the warmth of the doctors uh and also you get all of this stuff as well about um the brigadier's past because you find out or well, you it gets alluded to about his time that he spent in malaya as he puts it early on in his career and uh, which i think I think that ties in with what's said in Scalesman Justice as well. So we have kind of world building of the regular Doctor Who world, mm. um, yeah, even though, as you were saying earlier, I mean, the Brigadier is possibly slightly poorly served. I mean, the unit regulars, you don't get to see an enormous amount of kind of like in-depth study of them. If, if you want that, I mean, I think Scalesman Justice is probably um, the book for you as uh, you, you don't yeah we, we don't get many glimpses into kind of like the inner workings of mike's mind or benton's apart from his interest in star trek it's just so good yeah it's it's really solid i i really enjoyed this one it's it's almost a nine for me but yeah it's just there's a couple of of bits that i where it, it went a little but i suppose that's kind of a holdover from the new adventures days too where a lot of those books were more violent than... yeah i mean this is nowhere near as violent as 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 some of the the you know the new adventures i mean it's it's also not as um i mean you're saying about torchwood i mean it, it it's more mature than some of the torchwood episodes um <laughs> particularly season one yeah it's it doesn't have that juvenile kind of 14 year old thinking what a an adult show is like sort of yeah you do have that in some of the new adventures so uh yes <laughs> one of them we've already mentioned in this, in this episode no less <laughs> hello iceberg anything else you want to say about this uh book before we move on to no no it's just it's just it's just great isn't it it is that's all yeah, yeah. face of the enemy thumbs up yes indeed um let's move on to uh listener mail and feedback then we've got a mm. Got a couple of tweets to talk about. Oh, cool. We got a uh, thank you tweet from Sean from the TARDIS Tavern oh. uh, from last month. He mentioned he was very excited to be reading Doctor Who again. So <laughs> his appearance was well received. So we'd yeah. be great to have him on again. Yeah. And uh, yes. we got a mention from Sixth Pi on Twitter saying they were looking forward to the podcast discussion this month because McKinty's uh, Koshe mythos is one of the most underrated parts of the wilderness years so mm. we uh, 
yeah, that was definitely cool to get some more background on the master. We got an email from John noting, you know, that we had fun at, uh, Amy's expense last month and, (laughs) and, (laughs) and and we joked that she, uh, wasn't much of a reader. Um, he pointed out Uh, that she does end up being a successful book writer. She does. Of course she does. Yes. Yeah. Writing children's books. After she was trapped in the, in the past. So yeah, there was even a, I think a book tie in published under her name mm, uh it was yes called yeah. summer falls which doesn't have the doctor but it does have the curator <laughs> uh as one of the characters uh before he appeared in the 50th so though also because she's a model is it ghost written mm. back at you yes <laughs> You can be a successful model, I guess, and uh, and an author too, I guess. Yes, um, you can. You can. And and maybe <laughs> maybe she would have read more if the doctor didn't steal her reading glasses. So yeah, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. So maybe we're being being most harsh on on this bond. Yeah. Um. But yeah, thank you everyone for sending in your listener feedback. Uh, you can do that by reaching us on Twitter or via email at a n d w b c podcast. And uh, also be sure to leave us a rating on iTunes. It uh, it only takes a couple of minutes and it would help our podcast show up higher in the search results if someone searches for a Doctor Who podcast. Right now there are only uh, two reviews on there, one of which is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so so more would, more would be appreciated. Um, if we can, I think, get over 10, we'll start showing up in the main um, search uh, for Doctor Who. So that would be most helpful. Yes, please feed the algorithm. Yes. <laughs> so, um, should, should we reveal to the good folks what we're thinking of doing for next month? Sure. Uh, so next month, I'm going to go with arguably my favorite Doctor, uh, the second Doctor, <laughs> and read a, a second Doctor Jamie and Zoe book called uh, The Wheel of Ice by uh, Stephen Baxter mm-hmm. for uh, the month of July. Yeah. So this was um, about five years old. It was published back in... 2012 it's one of the uh deluxe books and it was the first classic novel that was published uh since the past doctor range was discontinued in 2005 so it's the first past doctor book that we had after a seven year gap so that's pretty cool Mm -hmm. and i don't know a whole lot about it other than it's more of a hard sci-fi tale so think like robert heinlein or the sci-fi series the expanse yeah or the uh recent doctor who episode oxygen mm-hmm. um so yeah looking forward to it yeah because stephen baxter um his sci-fi does tend to be very much on the side end of it it's uh, it does tend to be quite hard on the science yeah no it should be should be should be very good it's uh, yeah 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 it's, it's definitely something to look forward to right well until next month i've been matt in minnesota chris in south london happy reading listening to the all-new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast you can contact the show and follow us on twitter at a n d w b c podcast our music is the doctor who theme swing jazz version by george c music used with attribution under creative commons license until next month happy reading There's a Marvel Comics writer, mm. and I'm not sure which Marvel Comics writer, but he's under contract. And like every right. four or five years when his contract comes up, he keeps saying, I really want to write for Doctor Who. Can you let me do it on the side? And they mm. they tell him no. Okay. Remember his name. I'm blanking on his name, but I not remember. Dan Slott. Maybe. That sounds really familiar. Because Dan Slott is very public as being a big Doctor Who fan. That could be him. And he's the guy, he wrote Spider-Man for quite a while. So do you want to hear his idea for uh, for a book? Yeah, 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 go on then. Yeah, yeah. He wants yeah. to tell us a story that can only happen in comic books. Mm-hmm. So that... Makes sense. Tell, tell it from, tell a, a, an entire comic... <laughs> Oh, okay. Right. I, I, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Wow. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Okay. Yeah. And I, it would it would only work in in that medium, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So that, that could happen someday. <laughs>
Thank you.